Can you hear me all fine? All right, so we're gonna get started. Uh, welcome to the, I think it's the third or fourth cannabis, Santa Cruz County Cannabis Licensing Workshop. This is a very focused uh, study session we have planned for you today, whether you're here in the audience or out there in TV land. Um, thank you so much for being here, tuning in. Uh, today we have uh, an agenda that includes state agencies. We have uh, updates, um, a little different from the last presentation with Fish and Wildlife, the Regional Water Board, and the State Water Board. So those uh, officials will be speaking to you about the state permitting requirements that you need to be aware of um, going forward. If you haven't already made contact with them, they're gonna explain some, some uh, processes, to, processes to you and updates in that respect. So they're gonna start out, I think they're gonna take maybe five to 10 minutes each each, there's two speakers, or two, two talks, and then our cannabis licensing office, the local agency, is gonna speak next, and we're gonna give you a little more insight into really the how-to and mechanics of the permitting process, not just um, the process, but some more tips and tricks about how you should be thinking about developing your project going forward. We really want you to be successful in getting licensed, and I think this will be a helpful starter for you um, even the best and brightest uh, of you still need some help, I think, with understanding what we planners are looking for when we get your project uh, in our office. So hopefully this is instructive. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch over to the state for just some, uh, the first talk. We have Heather McIntyre with Fish and Wildlife. She's gonna provide some updates. Do you want this? Oh, that's it? Uh, no, no, do you want this or? <laughs> we like that. I like that. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening. Wow, a, a, couple of, a couple of familiar faces. Nice to see everyone. Um, the fish, uh, my name again is Heather McIntyre. I am the Santa Cruz County representative along with my coworker, Stephanie Holstedge. When you start coming to the department, the Fish and Wildlife, for your uh, permits, or if you have any questions, there's a 99% chance you'll be talking with either Stephanie or I. We do have a table outside with um, four staff. We have Corey, Andy, Stephanie, and myself, and we can answer questions for you anytime this evening. The Department of Fish and Wildlife is updating their permitting website, and it will have some, uh, it will affect you when you come to us to start, uh, start your permitting process. So we're gonna go over that very briefly today. Um, these are the types of projects that need a permit from the department, and you'll note there that it's cannabis and non-cannabis. It's not anything special we're asking you to do. It's something we ask of everyone. Cannabis does have some special options that our non-cannabis permittees do not have, but it, these are the types of projects that we'll be looking for. So when you provide us with your project information, we'll be looking at water diversions, we'll be looking for springs, we'll be looking for stream crossings. So our, our online portal is being updated. It will be updated by the end of the month, probably in the next two weeks. Uh, end of July, and things will be changing quite a bit. You'll need to go in and register, and your registration will be approved, and then you'll have the opportunity to determine which agreement is best for your project. We have three options for cannabis growers. We have a self-certification, a general agreement, and a standard agreement, and I'm gonna talk a little bit in depth about each of those as much as we can within five to 10 minutes. <laughs> So for self-certification, your project must not substantially modify any stream, river, or lake. And to date, so far, the types of projects we've seen coming through with self-certification are primarily industrial buildings on municipal water. That is not the only type of project that can get a self-certification, but that's the type that we've seen so far. And we have some flyers, and you'll see, I'll show these to you now, um, and they, they look like this, and there's, there's one for each of the project type, and it has the information I'm presenting today. So this is the type of information that you'll need when you go forward with your self-certification application online. You're gonna need to tell us about your property, a detailed project description, provide us with some maps, and, some, and tell us what your water sources are. Project description is really important. I've gotten things like, this project has no impacts, and that's my entire project description. <laughs> that's gonna slow the process. I can't process that. You need to tell me a little bit more about your cultivation site. Also in the self-certification process, there's a series of questions. Uh, they ask you questions about your water source, 
your infrastructure, and if you're doing any construction activities. And then the department comes back and we look at the information that you've provided, and then at that point we can determine if a self-certification is appropriate for your project. And if it is, we'll send you a letter that says um, your project does not require an agreement from the Department of Fish and Game, or Fish and Wildlife, excuse me. This is the golden ticket, the waiver, um, and you can take that to the California Department of Food and Ag, and you will meet their fish and wildlife requirement with that self-certification letter. If your project is a little more complicated and maybe doesn't meet the certification, the self-certification criteria, your next option might be a general agreement. The general agreement is a pre-written agreement, so we've already filled out the agreement. It has terms and conditions to protect wildlife, and, um, and you go through this agreement, and if you meet the criteria, which right now is if you have a stream crossing or a diversion, the general agreement might be for you. And if you go through the um, eligibility criteria, this is what that looks like. Uh, your water source can't have fish in it. You can't be taking listed species. Um, if you meet these criteria, a general agreement might be for you. So, and then when you decide you want a general agreement, make sure you read it because there are terms and conditions that you must comply with when you sign that agreement. And those conditions are administrative things like you have to have a copy of the agreement on your facility at all times, that kind of thing. Uh, reporting requirements tell us about, uh, I wanna say the reporting requirements are um, your water use for the month. And then there are also measures to protect fish and wildlife. And all of those conditions you must comply with if you choose to go with a general agreement. In addition, when you fill out your application, uh, you'll need some additional information, and this is where there'll probably be some overlap with the work you're doing for the county. We will need a biological resources assessment. We will need design plans that are detailed and we'll need a property diagram. And make sure your pop property diagram is also detailed. Tell us well your, where your well is, tell us where your cultivation site is. Make sure we know we can see it. Oh, nice, photos. Okay, <laughs> the types of terms and conditions that are included in a general agreement include design criteria. So if you have a, a, a bridge that uses a culvert to cross a stream, there'll be some specific culvert design criteria that your project will need to meet. There are administrative measures, wildlife protection measures, and reporting requirements. The general agreement can only be applied for online, so you'll need to go to our online portal for that. And if your project doesn't meet either of the criteria for those, you need to come to us for a standard agreement. And the standard agreement is not a bad thing in any way, it just means we're gonna work with you one-on-one -on -one and provide you the best agreement for your specific project. So where the general agreement is all written and it's generalized, this way we work with you as individuals and come up with the appropriate agreement for your cannabis cultivation project. We'll need similar information, tell us about your property, tell us about your project in detail please, provide us with maps and water sources. And there are ways to avoid delays. Number one, do sufficient project planning. And I think as you go through your local process, you will, be, you will have a very good idea of what your project's gonna look like and you'll have a lot of the information that you need. So the local process you're doing here with the planning agency is really gonna be beneficial for you. So make sure you're, you're, you know what you're doing. Make sure you have a detailed project description. This is really important to us because if you don't have a detailed project description, everything stops, we call you, we say, please help us out, this isn't enough, write something up. So that's important. Include all your project activities. If you have impacts, describe those. Don't let them be a surprise. Um, and submit it to the right regional office. So these are the things you need to do to make sure you do don't delay the process. It's, do it's very doable, especially with the planning stuff that you're going through here in the county. It's very common for the department to call and ask for some more information or to email and ask for some more information. This doesn't, this doesn't mean anything bad or good, it just means we need some additional details. So don't be surprised if we call and say, hey, I have a question about this. It's very common for us to do site visits. We wanna come out and see your project, and uh, so that's a very common response. That's 
if we ask to come do a site visit, don't be worried. It's nothing, we're not targeting you. It's just what we do. We wanna see the project and we wanna see how it works with the description that's been provided. And even though we're a state agency, we have Google Earth, I'm very excited to say. The state doesn't always get the high tech stuff, but we do use Google Earth to take a look at your facility. So if we look at Google Earth and we see three grow areas and there's one grow area described, we're gonna stop the process and ask for some additional information. So know that we go through this process most of the time. We also aim for consistency with other agencies, uh, especially when it comes to things like forbearance periods or aquatic base flows, pesticide use. Um, we try to stay in touch with our um, other partner agencies to make sure we're all going down the same path. And that makes it easier for you and it makes it easier for us as well. So get a permit, protect your investment, and protect our resources. Here is our phone number. Um, we just recently moved our office, but that is our new phone number for our main office. You can give us a call and you'll be able to talk to either Stephanie or I, and we'll be able to provide you any more information that you need, or if you have any questions during the process or before the process, please don't hesitate to call. Let us help you out and ease the process for you. And there are contact informations, and I think that's it. Yep. <laughs> so, and we'll be outside if you have any questions. Um, Come out to the table and there are four of us out there. We'll be happy to talk with you about your specific project. All right? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Evan. <laughs> <laughs> that was really quick. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Heather. So now we're gonna have uh, some words from the State Water Board and the Regional Water Board. They're teaming up to give this presentation. Again, I think five, 10 minutes or so. And um, they have some updates for you. So first we have um, Leah Lemoyne, uh, Lemoyne, excuse me, and Sean Rohr from the State Board. Leah's from the Regional Water Board and come on up and take it away. Hi everyone. I'm gonna talk about the process that you'll need to go through f through the water boards in order to get your CDFA license. Um, so I will be speaking. I'm from the Regional Water Quality Control Board based out of San Luis Obispo. So for your day-to-day -day implementation of the permit, you'll be dealing with me. If you have to get a water right, um, my colleague from State Board, Sean, will, he's gonna talk about that process, and you'll be working directly with the State Board if you end up needing a water right. So, oops, so we'll talk about who we are and what we're doing and what's the purpose of the permit, um, how to obtain coverage, what the general order is, um, and who's applicable, what the tiering structure looks like, and then um, Sean will talk about water rights. So the purpose of the Cannabis General Order, which was adopted last October in 2017, um, is to ensure the effects of water diversion and discharge of wastes associated with cannabis cultivation um, do not affect water quality, both surface and ground. Um, so if there's two pieces. There's the Cannabis General, General Order, and then there's Attachment A. And Attachment A is also called the Cannabis Policy, and that really has the nuts and bolts of requirements of what you need to do. So what I recommend is going to this website tonight and downloading both the order and attachment A and combing through the specific requirements. I'm not gonna get into them, so, um, but, you'll, but you'll definitely wanna be aware of them. It is, it's all on the paperwork that's out on the table, so don't worry if you don't get every dot right. Um, oh right, and they'll put it on the website. So the reason that this order was adopted is because these are just an ex example of a few of the environmental impacts that um, State Water Board was noticing directly due to cannabis cultivation activities up in the North Coast primarily, so a lot of erosion issues, streams that were getting water diverted out of them so much so that aquatic life was suffering, um, human waste, chemical waste from um, ag chemicals. So the cannabis general order is meant to mitigate some of these environmental impacts. Um, so the first step in the process is to uh, go to the portal, and there's a fact sheet about the portal outside, and I'll show you a slide, a screenshot of it in a moment. But you'll enroll under the general order. Um, if you need, everyone's gonna need to get enrollment in the WDR or waiver of WDR, um, and that is essentially the water quality permit. 
If you need a water right, you'll also get the small irrigation use to registration program certification. Um, so you will have one or two things after you go through the portal, either the notice of applicability, which is the water quality permit. Um, you'll definitely have that, and you may also have the SIUR. Um, here's what the portal looks like. Um, it's a pretty user-friendly online form, and you'll just tell us some basic information about your grow um, and your water source, how much you're cultivating, um, who, who the landowner is, those types of things. Um, there's the, the website. Um, and who, who needs to do this? So basically, the short answer is just about everyone. Um, there's an exemption for personal use, so if you are just growing six plants, you don't need to come to us. Um, there's a w there are there's a, a waiver, and then there's an enrolled you can be enrolled. So who needs to get a waiver? Um, that includes indoor sites, so truly indoor sites with a concrete floor or asphalt floor, or otherwise impermeable floor and permanent structure. Um, outdoor sites that are less than two th or less than two thousand square feet is that's would be considered conditionally exempt and would apply for a waiver. Um, but everyone else needs to enroll as either a tier one or tier two site grow. Um, and here is a little bit on the definition of indoor cultivation, which is one of the things that. Um, some f find a little bit confusing because a greenhouse, for example, many think of as indoor, but if that greenhouse has a dirt floor for the purposes of this permit, it's considered outdoor. So greenhouses, dirt floor, outdoor, you're gonna enroll as either tier one or tier two. Um, and this is how we determine your tier and your risk. So depending, there's tier one and tier two, and then there's low, high, low, medium, and high risk sites. Um, if, like I mentioned before, condition, then there's this conditionally exempt category. So if you're less than 2,000 square feet or you're truly indoor, you're conditionally exempt. You're going to apply through the portal for your notice of applicability, but we're gonna issue you a waiver. Um, if you are an outdoor grow, you're gonna apply through the portal, tell us what your disturbed area is and what your canopy area is, and depending on those values, we're going to say you're tier one or tier two. So if you're less than an acre, you're tier one. If you're greater than an acre, you'll be tier two. And that's based off of disturbed area, not canopy. Um, and next step is if you are within a riparian setback, you will be considered high risk. If you have a slope, if your can cannabis cultivation activities are taking place on a slope greater than 30%, you'll be considered moderate risk. Everyone else is considered low. So they're different, um, the requirements are slightly different based, and your reporting requirements will be slightly different based off of your tier and your risk. So Sean's gonna talk about um, water quality. Do we take any questions now? Okay, yeah. That's a great question. And <laughs> disturbed area. Thank you for asking that because I was hoping someone would. I was gonna talk about it anyways. Um, it is, so the disturbed area is going to include you, the actual footprint of your, of your grow. So it's gonna include the canopy area, any walkways that are between and or immediately around the area, and it also includes any soil that's been disturbed, any soil storage areas, any chemical or vehicle storage areas that are associated with the cannabis cultivation grow. And that's pretty much it. So if you have other disturbed areas on site that are not really associated with the cannabis activities, like there's a greenhouse growing something that's not cannabis or a house that's not affiliated, that doesn't count. So does that help? Okay. <laughs> Let's shine. Hi, good evening everybody. As I'm sure you're all aware, I'm Sean. So let's, uh, let's dive right into some water rights. All right, so you might need a water right, you might not. <clears throat> Here's a, you gotta go to this website anyways. So right, right up there, if you don't have time to get this, 
there's other ways to get it. So you need your water right or you need something from us that says you don't need a water right for your Cal Canvas license. That other website right there, that's our website, our particular website for water rights. Just a plug, we're on social media, like us, follow us, we're good people. <laughs> so he, we actually updated our portal and that's kind of the new login screen. I mean, I want to dive right in there right now, doesn't everybody else? Like, look at that. So, so that's, that's what it is. If you've been on, if you've registered already, there's a section you just register. If you haven't, you just log in with a new account. Uh, here's pretty much what Lee already mentioned for, for your Cal Cannabis license. There's the two different uh, requirements, water quality and the small irrigation use registration. I live on the water right side. So do you need a water right? If you have rainwater catchment, if you are purchasing water, or if you have a groundwater well, and, we're, and this is percolating groundwater, you do not need a water right. You still go in here, you select your water source, and you get something from us that says, hey, congrats, you're done. <clears throat> if you have a fully contained spring, a fully contained spring does not flow off your property any time during the year, you don't need a water right, but you have to prove it. You need to submit a report to us that has been completed by a qualified professional. We have a list of those individuals on our website. So, you'd need a water right if you're on a surface water diversion, stream, creek, river, um, or subterranean flow. So like if you have a shallow well, chances are you're tapping into a surface water source, you need a water right for that. So it's pretty easy, you just go to our website, and this is pretty much it. So the first box is the applicant. You log in, you enter your information. If you don't need a water right or if you don't need coverage for, the, for water quality, you're pretty much done. If you need one or both, then we go to the next box and that's pretty much our end. So you enter your information and then you pay, S seems simple. We do our technical review at the end, issue your water right and your notice of applicability you're good to go. And then there's just a few things you might need to do like moving forward for, for uh, like water use reports and you know, stuff like that. So <clears throat> some of the things you need to, if you're on water, uh, surface water, there are a few things you need to know. You're allowed up to 6.6 .6 acre feet per year. You have to be at 10 gallons per minute or lower. And the big thing about the surface water diversion is you're not allowed to divert during the summer period. So we call that our forbearance period. So the idea is you divert in the winter time when the water's there, you store it for the summer when you need it. Groundwater, rainwater, and springs that do not flow off the property, they, they do not have a forbearance period. Anybody on surface water has this forbearance period, which is November 1st through March 31st. So that's the diversion season. The forbearance period is the exact opposite, April 1st through October 31st. Everybody got that, makes some sense? So the, the important thing about that is, if you're on surface water and you need a certain amount for storage, you need to have that storage available. A few limitations. You cannot get your small irrigation use registration if you're on a fully appropriate stream system, if you're on the main stem of a wild and scenic river, if you're in a CDFW in-stream flow study area, or if you happen to fall within 600 feet of a tribal boundary, and that's your point of diversion. So if you Plot your point of diversion, and I could go back a little bit. So in our, in our system, it, it's pretty much, you plot a point of diversion, and if you are not allowed to do it in uh, any of these areas, you pretty much know right away. We, we send you uh, something that says, hey, you're in a fully appropriate stream system, you can't get your water right. So it's immediately. For the tribal boundary, if your point of diversion falls within 600 feet, you get a notice that says you have to get permission from the tribe to move forward. But you can still move forward and uh, complete your application some contact info, the uh, top number and uh, email address, that's our, our general line. You can find me right in the middle. I have some business cards out there if you need to talk. And Leah's information right there. And that's water rights in a nutshell. <laughs> you guys catch me outside? <laughs> All right, thanks. All right, thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you to our state partners for uh, continuing to show up and, and help us with stuff that I 
honestly don't still quite understand myself. I don't. Um, and, and so we will be continuing to do outreach. Um, I'm Robin Bolster-Grant, uh, Cannabis Licensing Manager for the county. Um, most of you are pretty familiar, so you probably know that already. Um, but um, you probably know as well that uh, our board adopted uh, an ordinance. We are now in the realm of application. And, and dealing with permits and licenses. We've been talking about this for a long time and, and we're here. So welcome. Um, it's been a haul getting here and, and the ordinances, as, as most of you probably know, um, run the gamut. Uh, 7128, we've got our licensing. 1310 covers zoning, land use stuff, uh, dealt with by planning. Uh, 1601, environmental, uh, regulations and our best management and operational practices. It's important, I think, to know that we're not picking on cannabis. If you were to come to the county and open up a, a coffee shop or a bookstore, you would have to be dealing with a whole bunch of regulations and permits. So um, welcome to, to regulation, I guess. Is, is it, I know it's overwhelming. I know that there's a lot, and that's why we're here doing this. Um, but just so you know, this is, this is how we treat um, commercial activity in, in Santa Cruz County. Um, it's important uh, as we move forward to understand uh, the zoning and the land use restrictions. I'm still getting folks asking me, you know, what zone districts uh, are, are uh, approved for what uses. Those are fundamental questions we can help. Um, we have a, a cheat sheet and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but before you're putting money into uh, a lease or you're buying property, you need to know what the restrictions are for your zone district. Some of them, um, our, our planning commission and our board um, tacked on quite a few uh, restrictions and, and you need to know. For instance, uh, timber production. Um, you've got uh, uh, limitations on tree removal. You have to establish a history of growing cannabis on that site. Um, then there are some really uh, restrictive uh, limitations on what kind of disturbance you can do. Um, and the same for many other zone districts, the residential zone districts. Those of you that were participating or listening in to our uh, public hearings um, know uh, know quite well, I think, uh, that there's a lot to, to get your arms around. Um, you need to know setbacks, you need to know minimum parcel sizes and canopy uh, limitations. Again, we're still getting quite a few questions about that. We have information uh, to help you with that, but again, before you make any financial commitments, you need to know um, what the limitations are to the property that you're looking at. You also have to establish your own eligibility, right? Everybody for cultivation um, has to have been growing in the county um, since before 2013 or non-cannabis farmers for three years. So commercial ag, on commercial ag zone property, thank you. So the basic eligibility, um, again, I'm, I'm still having to give folks some bad news because they're not aware of some of that basic um, uh, eligibility criteria. So ask and, and, and make sure that you're, you're familiar. We have a ton of information on our website, um, so don't be a stranger. Um, Let's see, oh, so that's, that. I mean, we've got copies of this. Um, Loretta put together this really helpful kind of cheat sheet that lists all of the, the types of licenses and the zoning and some of the restrictions. Again, minimum parcel sizes, uh, setbacks and, and canopy limits that apply. So um, grab one of these um, and this is always the place to start if, if, you're, just, if you're just starting with us. So you're gonna need both a license from our office and a use permit from the planning department downstairs. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that, but um, before you are, are thinking about your state license, you need to be talking to us. Um, there is overlap in the documentation that you need to provide uh, for both those processes. They go uh, in tandem, uh, parallel. Um, but you should also be aware that um, 
most license applications are going to require uh, a level five. And again, um, I'm looking at folks that, that know this, but if you haven't been following along, a level five means a public hearing. Um, and that's, that's not a small undertaking. Um, again, these are things that you need to be uh, keeping in mind. Um, the good thing about the land use uh, approval is that that runs with the land. So your permit that you get from planning stays with that property. You don't have to come back and, and renew it unless you significantly change the scope of your work. Uh, the licenses through our office do require annual renewal and inspections. So we've divided our, our process into different phases. Phase one is where we're at right now, and this is the pre-application review. Again, because we have these two different tracks with permits and licenses, we want you to start with us. In most cases, you already have a relationship with us. In most cases, we've been to your site and know a lot about it. So pre-app is our way of sort of scoping and figuring out um, if there's things that we're missing, if, if there are elements that uh, came up with the uh, um, adopted ordinances that you need to address, and most importantly, we're getting you ready for the actual application process. It is, again, it, it, there's a lot of material, and I've, I've heard back from folks that it is um, intimidating and, and daunting, and I understand that, and that's why we're here to help you through it. The more information you give us up front, the better we can help you. What you don't tell us will cost you in the long run. And, and in a lot of cases, I don't, it's not that people are hiding things from us, it's just you don't know um, what we're looking for. And you have, to, you have to learn to speak our language or hire somebody that does, just like you wouldn't um, you know, work on your own car necessarily or, uh, or draft legal documents. You need to understand on our side of, of the counter um, what we're looking for and that's gonna save you in the long run. So information like, you know, well, I'm, I'm growing indoor now, but I think what I wanna do is expand uh, for cultivation um, into this area over here. If you don't tell us that that's, that's your goal, that's what you really want, we can't evaluate that and tell you what the limitations are and what you're gonna need to do when you get to that point. So we want you to tell us the entire project, your build out, um, even if you don't do it, because you can get an approval without having to actually develop each phase. So again, I, I hear this pretty much all the time, like what, this is what I'm doing now. And I realize that most folks are already doing stuff. But you have a dream maybe, or you have an idea about what you wanna do ultimately. Tell us about it now. Because what you don't wanna do is have to come back and repeat the process with the planning department. You don't wanna have to go to a second public hearing. I promise, you don't want that. It's, it's, it's a pain and it's expensive. So tell us what you want and give us a lot of detail. Just like Heather was talking about your plans as much detail as you give us, that's what we can give you feedback on, right? So we're, we're having to educate folks a lot and that's understandable, um, but help us help you by um, giving us details, showing us everything that's on the property and go through that list that is on our website. Um, and when you're ready, we'll, we'll take you in. I've already had um, three pre-app appointments and in some cases, uh, folks were super prepared, gave me a lot of information, and in others, we're gonna have to spend a lot more time, and time is money, and time is not something that everybody has. Um, there is a cost for the pre-apps, um, the pre-app review. If you didn't do a pre-license inspection, um, then it's $1,500. Um, if you did a pre-license inspection, there's no fee. But if you come to an appointment and you're not prepared and there's stuff that you're missing, um, it, it's gonna cost you. We've, we've, we will continue to do outreach, we will continue to do workshops, but at the end of the day, we have to move into processing applications and, and helping folks move along. And so our time is gonna start to, it's gonna be costly. Um, right. What does that 1500 include? Is that just a 
Right, so so we go to site visits, which is why, so the, the pre-license inspection folks don't have to pay that because we've been to the site. Um, we want to go out and walk around and see that there maybe there's a stream over there that you know we didn't know about and, and maybe Maybe the, there's a, a dwelling that's you know within the setback or, or or something like that. So you're paying for that. You're paying for uh, our time to to um, talk to the planning folks and see what they're going to be looking for. We want to streamline your your process as you get ready to make your actual application. So this is the warm up consultation. If you're ready, I will. I will, I will talk to you about getting in. The, the problem that we're having. Repeat the question. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so he's asking how long does it take to get an appointment? Um, for folks that are ready, and again, the, the material's on our website, in the tab that says applications, and you read through the pre-application questionnaire, and it's thick. There's a lot of information we're looking for. We want you, for you to have thought through, well, what is my odor control plan, and what is my energy efficiency plan, and how am I going to deal with these, you know, the siting criteria, where I put everything that is the least destructive to the environment, habitat, what have you. Um, we want you to think about all of those things, and when you're ready, and you can answer, and it doesn't have to be perfect, you don't have to fill out every single piece of that, but again, the things that you're leaving out are things that we can't give you feedback on. So go through and answer it, and if, you're, if you think that you've answered all the questions, um, send me an email, and we'll get you in. It, we're not, <laughs> it's a little bit crickets right now with the, with the pre-applications because we're asking for so much, and we just started, I mean, we just sent this out a couple weeks ago saying this is the process. If you think you're ready, then talk to me. Um, if you did a PLI, then you have priority processing. But at this point, I, I'm willing to talk to folks that think that they have their packet together. But don't waste our time. It's not that I'm so special. I just, I, I can't, you know, I can't be your, your consultant. And so, and we'll talk a little bit later about consultants and the value and the necessity of having a team of consultants to help you get through this. Again, I wouldn't, you know, I don't try to do my own taxes. I pay somebody to do that. And this is not something that most people can get through without some help. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so phase two is the actual application. And this is where you're submitting however many sets of plans to the planning department for your discretionary use permit, and you're submitting material, and this is, will help you, this is what we're gonna prepare you for during the pre-app. You'll submit material to the Cannabis Licensing Office for your license. And you know you may be required to submit four or five sets of plans, because we're gonna take those plans, we're gonna route them to environmental health, if you have septic, to the Ag Commission, to fire agencies. And so um, this, this all happens, again, this happens with any, any application that comes into planning. Um, the, the public hearing, um, well, let me go through, let me go back. So the routing to all the other agencies, everybody has to go through environmental review under CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act. It could be as simple as an exemption. If you're not changing the environment, if you don't have an impact on the environment, you could be exempt from further review. Or it could be more involved if there are habitat issues, if there are traffic issues, um, if there are noise issues. Anything that, that, that sort of, you know, hits that red flag, um, then we do a little bit more investigation. You might be required to submit reports. Um, a lot of folks will be submitting biotic reports. Other folks will have to submit a traffic study. It depends on, all of this is, is a function of the scope of work. This is the project that you create, right? Um, and then again, public hearings for a lot of different projects. Um, not everybody, but but a lot. Um, uh, at cost billing, a lot of folks are asking about fees. At cost means just what it says, we'll, we'll ask for a deposit, both the planning department will ask for a deposit and the licensing office will ask for a deposit and we will bill our time. If, if there's a phone call, if there's an email, if we, we go out to the site, all that time is billed at our 
hourly rate and, and planning does the same. So again, being prepared, having all your material together and not you know, saying, is this, I, I tried doing this, will answer your questions. But my, in my experience, and I worked for planning for a long, long time, the projects that ended up costing the most were the ones where folks were not responding to what we were asking. And it's not necessarily, you know, on purpose, it was just sometimes not understanding. Or maybe if I, maybe if I give them this, this will be good enough. If somebody wants a specific thing to be shown on a plan or wants a report to say a certain thing or address a certain issue, give them what they're asking for. And if you don't understand, you can, you can call. But again, this is where consultants can help you so much. They know the questions to ask. They know what the planners are looking for and, and they'll know what we're looking for because it's really very much the same. But so just in terms of cost, it's very much a, a function of what we get from folks and how many questions we have to ask if we're looking at plans and we can't tell, is this, is this a stream or is this an easement? What, you know, what's going on here? All of those things take time and time is money. Um, so after you get your, <laughs> bad news, good news, after you get your permit um, and, and your license, um, there'll be ongoing compliance, really with the license, but you will be subject to conditions. And every, every project has, uh, every discretionary project has conditions of approval. Uh, conditions for um, your, your use permit may be that you have to come in and get a building permit at some point. Or if you have some sort of um, screening, you have to maintain that. So there'll be conditions that attached to that. So the ongoing compliance is about making sure um, that, that you're doing what you said you were going to do, that you're maintaining the, the site in the way that you said you would. Um, and um, yeah, that, that, that we're, all, um, we're all on the same page. And we will be inspecting um, for the license. And that is, again, that's the, the, the cost is, is at cost. Um, the clearer you are about what we're looking for, the less it costs. Um, we have different types of, of licenses, and folks have been asking a lot about this. And if you were at any of the, the hearings, you know that um, the co-location master plan came up as a way um, to sort of to help folks and to limit disturbance. Vertical integration. So. Vertical integration just means you, licensee. Thank you. <laughs> um, you have a license to distribute, to manufacture, and to cultivate on, on one property, right? So that's not a co-location, that's one licensee uh, with different types of licenses, or one property, I should say, I guess, with different. So you're one entity and you do all those things. So that's vertical integration, multiple licenses on one property. Co-location is when you are, you have multiple different entities. So it's not just you doing cultivation and manufacturing. You're doing cultivation, your, your friend or a partner or somebody else that, that has come down maybe from a site where they, they didn't meet the requirements and they need a place to go. Co-location, the idea of co-location was to find a home for folks who didn't qualify or had sites that weren't compliant with the regulations, right? So a lot of folks in, in the mountains, um, folks in residential areas um, that for a variety of reasons can't meet those requirements. Um, this is a way to, to open up some sites, particularly large parcels. Um, and so you can mix and match a little bit with, with different license types. Um, I think the example that we had was, you know, if you have like 100 square feet of existing greenhouse space or warehouse space and you chop it up into, into sections and you can have, you know, five or 10 different licensees all growing, maybe somebody's making something, somebody else is acting as a distributor, that's a co-location. And, and what we're looking for is an agreement. And the, the comparison is like a shopping center. So you have the, it says master occupant, I guess I would, I would say sort of the primary uh, person that, that takes the lead on this um, will be in charge of the use permit. So if you think of a shopping center, 
There's one applicant that comes into planning and they get a permit, commercial development permit for a shopping center. They don't know who all their tenants are maybe. Those tenants are each gonna have to come in and get their own um, you know, like business license or something just for the sake of argument. So here, the, the, the great thing about co-location is that not everybody has to get a use permit in this scenario. One use permit for the whole site that takes into consideration all of the activities of the licensees. So if you have that warehouse or that greenhouse and you have 10 different licensees all growing, your permit that you're going through, the, the planning department says, you know, maximum of five or 10 licensees, maximum canopy, but we also wanna know what that operation looks like when it's all running. How many employees are there? What's the parking situation? How many trips? How many vehicles coming in and out of that property? So all of those things are, are things that, that um, the primary applicant would be responsible for, and then everybody else just needs to get their license from us, and they can come and go, but that use permit, the, the co-location use permit, that's a lot of verbiage, um, that stays with the property, All right? So it makes it easy for, for folks to come in and out, and I know um, that this is a new concept and the idea of sharing space, I get a lot of sort of looks like, ah, oh, well, I know, I just have my own little thing. This is gonna save a lot of people. This is gonna make the difference for a lot of folks between being in this industry and not. If you're on a site that doesn't work, you know, you're, you're gonna have to think about partnering up with, with other folks. And so, and it's being done, I promise, in other places and, and nothing horrible has happened as far as I know. Um, but we need an agreement. And so again, whoever's taking the lead, it could be the property owner. I know at least uh, one or two of the, the cut flower farmers down in South County are, are considering this. Um, they might you know, run the, the use permit and, and, and get that for, for the site, um, or it could be one of the licensees. Doesn't really matter, but, um, but the agreement has to be tight enough so that we know if there's a problem, who's responsible, right? If somebody didn't properly dispose of their waste or there's, you know, there's something, there's erosion or something is happening, we need to know who's, who's responsible. So, so the agreement, it's, it's sort of, I don't, sort of like CCNRs or something, right? So, so it, just, it just lays out what, what the basic rules of the road are for all the licensees and then who's responsible for doing what and, and what happens if, if things go wrong. So people are asking if there's like a template for this. No, we just, we're kind of making it up. I mean, it, it, the idea again was to help folks. So it's not, you know, I can tell you what, what we use for shopping centers and stuff in, in planning, um, but we don't have a template. That could be something that we work on, um, or you can talk to an attorney about, uh, about because it's a contract basically, right? The master plan is different. Uh, the master plan was a way of, of consolidating infrastructure. So this is where you have different parcels and they're sharing uh, a house or an access road, right? And so it will also require an agreement. Um, but again, the idea was that, so for, for SU parcels, SU zoning, RA zoning, some of the, the zone districts that require you to build a house, for instance, we don't want everybody to have to build a house. That's a lot of development. We don't always like that. So if you can share, if your neighbor has a house, and you're, you're adjoining and you can come up with a plan where you describe how you're sharing and it can be sharing a road. So not everybody has to grade a road through you know, a hillside or something. Um, and again, you can mix and match different types of, of licenses, um, but the idea is uh, it, it's all gonna be about the plan and this will come from you. You have to be creative about how you're gonna structure this. We can tell you what we're looking for, but you have, to, you have to sort of think it all the way through and say, you know, are they responsible? Who's responsible for maintaining the road? Is that, you know, because you're both potentially gonna have licenses. So, so there are a lot of details to it, but this is, this is different than the co-location. So um, that's been confusing. Uh, permit bundling just means that you can go to um, planning and get all of the, the, the permits that you need 
separate from licenses, um, at one time. So you can get, if you need um, a grading permit, if you need any other sort of discretionary permit, um, you can, um, it, it's a kind of a one-stop shop. You don't have to go back and forth. So under your use permit, um, and we can, we can talk specifics later, it's, it's hard to, um, to think of a, a really good example yet because I haven't seen everybody's project. Um, but the idea is to minimize the time in and out of their office. Right, um, so if you think ahead and you know you're going to need to, I don't know, build a, a big structure and that needs its own use permit, you can take care of all of those things at, at one time. So th really this just gets back to the idea of ask for what you want, think ahead and, and, and be creative, but think about all the stuff. Don't, don't be limited to what you've been doing or what you think you wanna do. You don't have to actually do it, do you know what I mean? Like you can, you can say, you can get a permit to, to build a house. Well, it can take you five years before you get around and get your construction loan together and actually build it. But it, it's better to ask and not have to come back and go through all of it to change it later. Say it again. And they can clean up your violations. And you can clean up your violations. <laughs> Nobody has violations here. But if you did, then you can take care of all of that. It would be a requirement anyway. We would ask, and these are, these are conditions of approval. Um, and so, yeah, if, if whatever you have going on out there that you need to fix, um, even if it's not related to cannabis, you can rope it in to this, this process. And, and save yourself some time, but you don't want to go back and forth. You don't want to make changes later. It's super spendy. All right. I think that's you. Greta, take it away. Great. Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing? <laughs> We're just getting started. No, I'm just kidding. I, I shouldn't take too long. <laughs> I shouldn't take too long, but uh, I think Robin really kind of hit uh, the nail on the head here. Ask for what you want. We're going to talk more about that now. Uh, so business planning and scoping your project, that's, that's really critical for ingredients for success. Um, you know, your application should be rooted in a solid business plan. I would hope and I imagine most of you have at least gone through basic exercises, but honestly at the counter we've heard people that haven't even really thought that through because they've been operating in a situation where they didn't have to, um, they really didn't have to defend their um, operations to anyone. There's no licensing, there's no permits, nothing. They were just up and doing what they do. Um, same with employees, no, just no, really no, you know, process. So. It's new for them to have to, to to put a plan together, and there are resources out there. They're very simple, just very simple thought processes you can go through to um, you know articulate what do you plan to do, um, how do you plan to do it, um, doing forecasting, basic forecasting of your finances, very critical, basic thing to do before you get started. I don't recommend you try to get a license with us if you don't even try this part. Um, if you're unwilling, unable to do that, I don't think it's you know it's just going to make it so much harder for you to move forward. And you're going to have to, we're going to kind of force you to answer those questions in a way when you do your application anyway. But um, we do recommend a resource, um, as an example, Santa Cruz SCORE. They're a um, Santa Cruz based um, entity that, it's a nonprofit, I believe, and they, uh, they actually are federally funded, so they can't exactly do cannabis per se, but they do have resources on the website um, that um, exactly help you just pencil out your business plan. Um, and you can always try to talk to them and see what they can do to help you with designing that part. So mm, there are a lot of resources in, in that respect. As far as project scoping, um, hang on here. So back to ask for what you want, um, you really need to think of a reasonably foreseeable plan for development. And you, what, what I mean by that is, uh, as Robin already articulated, I think before you, we don't wanna just know, because a lot of people I talk to, they say, well, I have this 2,000 square foot grow, um, yeah, I want this. Is that all you want? I thought you know, you're eligible for 10,000 square feet. Well, yes, I do want that actually, but maybe not today, maybe in three years. Oh, okay, good. So you actually want to talk about that now because this is your chance. Like Robin said, you don't want to be going to planning three, four times. 
Trust me, you don't. I think it's a really, they're very nice people, but you just don't want to, you don't want to go back and forth with them. I think um, you, you want to give them the whole of your project, your whole idea, reasonably foreseeable in the next three, five years. You know, some people want to do multi-million dollar facilities, and but they say, well, we don't want to set that up yet. Um, but it's okay to tell the planning department now, this is phase one, phase two, phase three, and you articulate that square footage. Or maybe in the beginning, you don't want to do manufacturing, but in year two, you do. Talk about that. You don't have to lock in the exact date, but the development itself is very relevant. And we want to know early and upfront what that looks like. And that also helps the planner when they do environmental review to think about what are the build out implications of this proposal. Um, and that removes back and forth for you and helps us prevent segmenting CEQA, which we don't want to do because that's illegal. So um, project scoping, and I already talked about that, but yeah, you, you see there um, the idea of phasing your development, talking about it early. Um, and, uh, and by the way, this doesn't just include the physical development. So you may have that right now you have no employees or a couple of employees, but really at build out, you're gonna be up to 50 people on a property, maybe in CA land with big greenhouses and you might have seasonal employees. You might wanna have five trucks to distribute your goods. Those are the things to be thinking about now. And that's why the business plan is important. What can I actually afford to do? What do I wanna do when I have more money coming in? It all kind of inter it's intertwined. So I hope that helps you a little bit. We're, a lot of people we're talking to haven't been thinking that way, but this is the time to say it. So what makes a good project proposal? Very clear um, idea of what's out there now. We wanna see that. We asked for that on the site plan anyway, so it's not like it's a mystery. It's on the application requirements. What's out there now? Uh, what are the uses out there now, if anything? And then of course, what are your future plans? Um, you should, a lot of people have come into us and they have no, they've not even cracked open and they may not know to, but you should crack open the planning permit files on the property. Either before you even acquire our property to make sure you don't have any crazy red tag um, issue um, before you lock in a lease or purchase. Um, and also just to see if it's like, say, a commercial building and it has been permitted for something else, you need to know what the, con the requirements were at that time. Uh, it's very important so you um, don't get surprised later that they did illegal additions to the property that you didn't notice and didn't show on your site plan. Because the planner's gonna wanna see what was there before, what's new. So that'll help you remove the back and forth of planning. You don't wanna go back and forth with them about these kind of questions when you or your consultant could just get that information up front. Um, so another thing is, again, well thought out, clear design plans. So showing that structural development, all the buildings, whether they're cannabis related or not, we do wanna see that now. This is time to see what's on the ground. Um, proposed and existing, and uh, including your phasing, and you can show that too on your site plan very easily. You just say, um, you can either have that in a descriptor, a written description, and you can have you know grayed out areas that are the future development. Um, site security, things that we're gonna require you to show, you should show that also on your plans. You know, where's your fencing gonna go? Um, this locks into the uh, best management operational practices plan. In there, you'll notice we ask you, um, yes, you need to secure your site. It's up to you to decide how that needs to be done. We're not gonna dictate all terms. A lot of stuff, by the way, in the ordinance is not locked in. There's a lot of room for you to say what your operational requirements would be, including security. But remember, to reference the other requirements in, in the ordinance, which include this best management operational practices uh, plan, because we ask you to also make sure you're not disrupting wildlife movement or um, inadvertently, or um, putting in fencing that would not be authorized because it could, cat, you know, deer could get locked, you know, caught on it or something. So there's details like that you gotta be tracking as you describe your proposal. Um, not too hard to do, but just cross check what you say you wanna do with what we say be cautious of, you know. Um, in terms of environmental or neighborhood compatibility. Um, so yeah, that's kind of touches on that show environmental protection neighborhood compatibility piece. Talk about that as you describe your project. Um, and, uh, and I wanted to mention about that, that it's very important when you talk about your project, you're your own uh, proponent, you know, you wanna, you wanna 
you know, we don't necessarily honestly want to hear, no offense, but about how organic and great you are and about your product. I, you can talk about that a little bit, but it's not, it's really just not relevant to the planning question at hand. You know, what do you want to do physically and how are you going to make sure you protect your neighborhood and the environment? Let's, let's like tie that piece together and less, and, and less focusing on, and we want to know what you're making and everything, but focus more on, um, hey, there's a school within X feet of my development and I'm actually too close, but this is what I'm going to do to make sure that that's not a conflict. So defend your proposal, make sure you're thinking about this so that you tie up loose ends where we're going to say, well, hey, what are you going to do about that school? Or what are you going to do about the fact that you're next to um, a creek? You're too close, you know, just, yeah. Be thinking of these things as you talk about what you want to do. So at the end here, I just talked about the best management practices. That, that siting criteria and site design, I'm not going to get into this too much, but it's so important before you put pen to paper that you think about these things that we're telling you you need to think about and you need to have addressed in your application. If it's not there, you don't want to get sent home. Um, we want to work with you. We just don't want incomplete thinking. And so things like minimizing grading, if you show me a road that's, you know, in a bad spot, you know, where you're gonna have to cut into the hillside and cut down 40 trees when you could have gone over to another area and done much less damage, we're gonna say, why don't you go here? So let's not spend money on expensive plans that are drawn by an architect when you could have just, you know, thought about this early. Um, avoid cutting down trees, protect habitat, make that footprint as small as possible for your development. If you can minimize the sprawl, that's what we want to see you try to do. We don't have a number for you. When we say minimize the footprint, we're not saying it has to be this big. But we do want to see that you try to consolidate everything in a tight way so that the, the proposal is um, meeting the needs of the county as well as your uh, operation. And um, yeah, there's other things about infrastructure and, and visual screening you need to blend into your description. So nothing is too hard, but you do need to think like us to be successful and to get through quicker. Um, we'll be very happy with that. And uh, let's see, oh, the, the competing conflicting policies, just be aware, as I alluded to, there are these best management practices. They, they aren't the ordinance directly, but they are just as, um, important and required as the stuff in the ordinance. And um, you know, there are things like ADA compliance some people haven't even thought about. They're gonna have employees, potentially. You, you actually, a commercial operation has to be ADA compliant. What's that gonna do to the, you know, what kind of grade do you need to access your cultivation area? Um, you might not think you're gonna have employees, but that's state law, like, you can't, that's just the way it is. So you need to be thinking ADA compliance. Um, if you have geohazards on your property, you need to look at, well, what does that mean for where I've sited my building, where it is or where I want it to be? Um, you know, these are the things I would be tracking. Now I'm gonna switch over to a very, very uh, important piece, which is fire code. So the California fire code um, is, um, implemented by our local fire agencies. And for cannabis, there is, um, they've already, the fire officials have already spent a lot of time thinking how they're gonna um, handle cannabis in terms of its commercial status. And we do have Chris Walters with Cal Fire who's going to talk to you a little more about um, this piece. The reason it's so important that you hear Chris is because a lot of people, even in CA land where they think they're in, you know, they're out in the middle of a field and it's flat and all this, Cal Fire or the fire agency that will apply to you still will be looking at it and maybe differently than you expect. It's not tomatoes, it's looked at differently. There's different considerations with construction and the grow lights and the, you know, all the different um, infrastructure you usually put in with cannabis. So uh, that could very much change your site plan or even the scope of your project or your phase out, the, your, your, your phasing in of your development. Um, so as you consider where you wanna be and how you wanna grow your business, I would talk to fire like as early as possible. It's not that they won't have additional or new requirements later, they can't promise that, but what they can do is give you early warning and feedback about the things they'll need to see. Some people, you know, it's a deal breaker if they have to put sprinklers in, and maybe they do for a project. Um, what you tell the fire department 
now and early on and as upfront as possible will really help them help you understand what to do. And then in response, you'll say, perfect, I can do that, or this, is, this won't work, I need to find another property or I'm out of it, or I'm gonna scale back what I said I wanna do so I can stay here. Um, not to scare you, but reality check is you want FIRE to check your property as early as possible before you really get those site plans put together, I would say. So with that, I'd like Chris to chat with you guys. Evening, uh, my name's Chris Walters. I'm with the Santa Cruz County Fire Marshal's Office and I re represent, uh, the County Fire Marshal's Office represents those areas outside the fire districts. So you have established fire districts like Central Fire, Scotts Valley, Ben Loman, Boulder Creek, all those fire districts. My area, like Bonnie Dune, Coralitas, is outside of those fire districts. Um, and I wanna talk about uh, some of the information that I will be interested in. All the fire districts have similar requirements, so they would be also interested in this type of information. I unfortunately don't have a nice PowerPoint. I'm just gonna be reading it off to you. Um, some of the uh, background information you contact the fire district. Um, well, first of all, um, you need to find out where your site is and what fire district you're in. Um, contacting the wrong fire district doesn't help out. Um, you can find that on the county GIS, uh, contact our office or any one of the fire marshal's offices and they'll be able to tell you what district, what fire district you're in. They'll, they'll provide the, the phone numbers of the fire district personnel that you'll need to contact for further information. The information, the background information we're very interested in is your, we need your contact information, phone numbers and emails so that we can communicate. Um, the address of the intended operation site, parcel number of the intended uh, operation site. What is the zoning? Some of the background information, a lot of the background information that Loretta was talking about. What is the zoning of the parcel? Um, especially if you're using buildings for growing in or operations within the building. Uh, we wanna know um, what were the building permits for those buildings? Um, are there any outstanding buildings? And um, do the buildings even have building permits? Were they permitted at all in the first place? Um, one thing aside, typically growing cannabis or any other crop on the ground without any associated buildings don't really trigger any fire requirements. Fire tr requirements are triggered by buildings themselves. Um, what was the use permitting uh, for the parcel prior to your current operation and how, is it, how would that affect uh, your, your use permitting forward? Um, and then what is the occupancy class and what, was, what were the buildings that uh, you're gonna be using, what were they, what was the occupancy class of the building prior to your use? And uh, what was the occupancy class of the building prior to, prior to use and was it designed or built for your particular use? That's all information that can come from uh, planning building department. You'll have to do research as Loretta alluded to originally. Now, you can contact us, give, uh, you can, send that to us in email um, and we can review it and then we'll wanna do a site visit and we'll wanna know what the current conditions are of the site. Um, specifically, and this is again, stuff that Loretta alluded to, but what do you intend to do and in what buildings or what is your operation? We're growing outside in this area, we intend to do manufacturing in this area or, or in this building and um, those are all things that we'll need to take into account prior to uh, giving you any information on specifics for your buildings. Um, what buildings will be used and what the purposes uh, will be, what will be, what those purposes will be in those buildings. Uh, what is the construction class of the buildings and the square footage of the buildings that also uh, goes to uh, required water storage or fire flow, depending on if you're in municipal water or don't have uh, municipal water, you're on a well. Uh, do the buildings already have fire sprinklers? Uh, if the fire sprinklers, and if 
their fire sprinklers in the building and some sort of extinguishing agent or extinguishers? Are they up to date and current? Uh, they need to be sprinklers, require five-year five inspections. Uh, extinguishers for commercial areas require uh, recertification once a year. What is the current water source and where are the fire hydrants for this? Now we're talking specifically buildings in construction. You're, you're doing some sort of operation growing or processing that sort of thing within buildings. Where are the current, what is the current water source and where are the fire hydrants for the, con for the buildings? Remember these are commercial buildings, they're not residential, they don't qualify for a lot of the residential exceptions. Uh, what is the fire flow from those hydrants and how long can that be maintained? Uh, now, moving on to from hydrants, uh, where is the county maintained, where is the end of the county maintained road from your site and what is your current access to those buildings? We're c concerned about road widths, surfacing, slope, turn radii on very narrow roads. Those all, that's all information that we want to collect as we meet with you on site. And you can do the homework ahead of time. So some of the things to consider, and again, Loretta alluded to it, what are the intended, operation, intended changes to the operation? What is your goal? If this year you're not using this building, but two years from now you intend to do manufacturing in it, well, those are things that we'll want to need and we can advise you on what the potential consequences that will be. Um, realize that fire code changes every three years, so as this moves forward, I'm sure there will be more or different regulations within the fire code concerning cannabis. What's your operations plan for the future and where do you hope to grow? Uh, so that's a site visit, some background information, information that we will be able to provide you a pretty good detail on what fire requirements will be. Access road, water storage and or hydrants and fire sprinklers. Um, there are other things within buildings if you're doing manufacturing and if you have uh, controlled areas, uh, exiting, those sort of things that goes into building construction. Some of the information that we'll need in the building permitting phase, I think that was phase three-ish. Okay, uh, so we'll need uh, detailed site plans, plans for the buildings that you intend to use. For manufacturing operations, we will need details and cut sheets for your listed equipment. We'll need cut sheets for booths if you intend to use those and we'll need the listings for the, the booths. Um, we'll need hydrants and flow information. And if the, current flow inf uh, the, if the current flow from the hydrants does not meet the uh, current requirements based on square footage and construction type of your building, um, what improvements do you intend to make to that storage and or hydrant system? And you have to keep in mind, aside from uh, county planning building permits, uh, tank and hydrant permits are a deferred submittal through the fire marshal's office. There are set, what's a deferred submittal is a separate permit, similar to fire sprinklers and any other fire alarm system. They're a separate permit through your local fire district. Um, we'll need uh, details on access road, again, slope, surfacing, widths, um, and what your intended improvements and how much grading that may involve. We, we don't specifically need to know grading, but that will go to the planning department. Um, for buildings with cannabis operations inside, fire sprinklers more than likely would be in required. Fire sprinkler permits, again, are deferred submittal through the fire marshal's office. And lastly, or not quite lastly, but tanks, pumps, hydrants, pipe, sounding devices and all systems attached to fi fire suppression or fire safety devices are all required to be listed and designed for the operation they're intended to be used for. So if using ag pumps for a fire sprinkler system is not allowed. That pump needs to be listed for the service that 
is required of it, fire sprinkler system. Um, appropriate building plans uh, and construction plans would need to be routed through the building department as uh, Robin talked about, and the appropriate permits needed for construction. And we would review all of that and uh, um, uh, approve those projects. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sorry. That's a lot. <laughs> it was quick. That's a lot of stuff. And so, and so we're going to have questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I was just going to. I was just going to remind folks. Um, Lots of information. We will have links to to fire requirements and, and all sorts of stuff. But you should also know that that this uh, workshop is is being taped, so don't have to worry about you know scribbling everything and, and and memorizing everything right this second. I wanted to ask you really quickly just a couple of things that have come up a lot lately, and, and um, I'm sure you'll you'll get other questions. Um, shipping containers are sort of a very uh, popular way of, of um, you know, uh, housing different aspects, um, cultivating and manufacturing. Do you treat those differently than other types of structures? So. So I think um, if you had them wired for electricity, mm -hmm. um, then you're using it as essentially a building. So building standards would apply. Um, I'm not sure, I think we'd have to talk to the building department to find out where that cutoff is. Um, I, I would guess that they don't allow electrical or fans or heaters or dryers within that without proper permitting that would be my guess. If you're using a, a shipping container by itself, storing stuff, I think there's only requirements, and I, I don't know the exact answer, but I think there's only requirements on how many you can have right. at a specific specific site. That's true, that's true. I think, I think that there's sort of the, at least the popular perception is that it's not somehow a real structure, it's not a real building, because you can you know, have it hauled off relatively easily or because it's metal, it, it doesn't burst into flames or something. So I just wanted to make sure I got your take on that, that this isn't, it's not exempt just oh. because of the type of construction of it or the fact that it can be hauled off. Right. Okay. Another question that comes up a lot, um, um, folks that are not able to meet the rigorous 20 foot wide roads and, and large water storage requirements, um, are trying to think outside the box. And so there are folks that have come up with um, mobile uh, processing. And so it's not, it's not a structure, but if you, you know, if you drive up in a, you know, 18 wheeler or something and you're doing it and then you go off, off site, what's your right. take? So uh, 18 wheelers, Department of Transportation, it's got a light <laughs> not plate. Not a structure. Yeah, not a structure, right. So, but if you site it or if it has some sort of structure-ish type thing, and then you site it on site, um, then it becomes a structure. There are specific requirements on that structure, and then it can only, if it's considered temporary, it can only be in place. I think the maximum is 180 days via a permit through our office. Mm -hmm. um, temporary structures require permitting. Um, and, and it's it, it can depend, but the maximum is 180 days. Um, so, and then uh, like refrigeration, like an 18-wheeler refrigeration right. thing, that's all under Department of Transportation. It's a licensed vehicle, doesn't have any fire requirements. Cool. Okay. Now it's your turn. Oh, okay. Yeah, I will. Fire hydrants? Yeah, I'll take it out next time. So, can you repeat? Yeah, repeat for the. Could you summarize that question? Okay. Um, so, uh, she has a water storage and a water connection, but it's not shaped essentially like a fire hydrant that you'd see on the corner. Um, do you need a fire hydrant? Are you using buildings for your processing, growing, not specifically greenhouses um, without artificial light, but are you processing within a building? Well, not now, no. But, you know, where is it? Are you growing outside? 
are you growing outside? It's in a greenhouse. Okay, um, but not with artificial light? Not, no artificial light. Okay, so the water storage and fire flow requirements are gonna be minimal. You will need something that looks like a hydrant. I mean, I, I know I see a, quite a few of them out there and I went to a site the other day, it was a pl piece of plastic PVC that came out of the ground and the guy said, there's our hydrant. From the fire perspective, that's not what we look at as a, as a hydrant. So you can ch essentially chop that plastic off and put a standard hydrant right over the top of it and it would, it would meet, it would be sufficient. It needs to look, right, right. So that's what our guys are looking for in the middle of the night is a hydrant and, and a piece of pipe out of the ground. They, they won't know that's what it is. I'm going to come to you so we can hear. Uh, I've had to install a wharf head in the past for this. Does that qualify as the hydrant? So it, it depends on the flow. It doesn't look like hydrants, but it, it right. So no, the hookups exactly. Right, but and it has the two inch or the three. No, no, it, it, that's considered a hydrant also. Okay, that's but okay. but it depends also on the flow because it's only two and a half inch discharge, and if your flow is more is more than what a two and a half can provide, then you may need the full hydrant that's got two two and a halfs and a four. Gotcha. Depends that on the flow. That would basically be based on structures then. R it would be based on square footage and construction type. Yeah. Um, first, uh, I was going to ask if you could post that checklist or maybe give it to them to post online because we have some consultants and I'd love it if they can just Yeah, work I'm that. working. We, we've been Great. working on one. I haven't quite got it yet. Okay. But. And then also, um, I noticed in the county code, and I'm not an expert at reading these, but there was on agricultural parcels, there's um, some ability to use alternative fire sprinkler systems. Um, maybe, they, maybe it's referring to... Um, the chemical suppressant rather than water is that do you uh, is there guidance on that because it's it's basically up to the county fire marshal which is you guys um and i'm not sure what your perspective is on that like for instance if you do have a storage shed that's a container out you know placed in an agricultural parcel would um a chemical suppressant system similar to like what restaurants use be acceptable Okay, that's possible. So there is a section in the fire code. It doesn't speak to that specifically, but there's a, a section in the fire code right at the beginning under permitting and everything that's called alternate means. And you would have to provide documentation from whoever built the system that this system meets the requirements. So if fire sprinklers were required, then this system as an alternate meets, means meets the requirements of the sprinkler system. For like NF, the so, fire protection uh, right, so NFPA 13 is the sprinkler system requirements. Um, so your proposed new uh, other system meets those requirements or exceeds. Yeah, you just need to provide that documentation. Yeah. Robert, so that's new. No? In the back? No? Well, okay, sorry. I'll back come back. Here. No, no, Mike. Wait for the mic. Okay. <laughs> So about her question with the fire hydrant, uh, does that does that need to be within the building, next to the building, or just for the property? Uh, so <laughs> there are a couple of requirements there. Um, it's a fire hydrant is required to be f within f 400 feet of a commercial structure. So not in the building, but within 400 feet of the commercial structure. It typically needs to be on the drive access way, you wouldn't put it behind the building or bury it somewhere we, where we couldn't get to it. Um, there is a allowance if you have, or your buildings are sprinkled, then you can go up to 600 feet. So if you had a site and you put the fire hydrant up in front, you would wanna be able to get within 400 feet of the, the essentially the back of the structure. Okay, that answers my question. Yeah, yeah. Real quick as well, if if you have a greenhouse structure, permitted permanent greenhouse, yep. do you need a sprinkler system inside the greenhouse for your canopy space? Or do you, or say you're, you have a drying space within that greenhouse, would it be better to just uh, include just the drying? Right, so you're tricky. Tricky question. It is a tricky question because a partially sprinkled building is by code in Santa Cruz County, and it's been that way for a long time, is not allowed 
So you would re it would be the whole thing, unfortunately. Um, we've been, obviously, if you're uh, growing within uh, uh, greenhouses that are already in operation or intending to build a greenhouse, there are exceptions for sp fire sprinklers for greenhouses, but those exceptions come with restrictions, restrictions about clearance around the, the structure. You need to have what are called 60 foot side yards. That's clear area around the structure. In the event the building unsprinkled goes up in smoke, it's not gonna burn down other property. This is what we're uh, essentially looking at. And it needs to be on commercial ag property. So back to the question, it might be easier to move your drying or whatever you intend to do outside of the building, then you don't have to sprinkle 50,000 square feet. You only have to sprinkle, I don't know, 20 feet or, you know, 200 feet. Yeah. Thank you. Hi there. Um, is there a way to calculate how much uh, water storage you need for a, uh, an indoor sprinkler system? For the sprinkler system yeah. It itself? Yeah. Uh, so there is, it's, it is a little bit complicated. It's, it's uh, NFPA, National Fire Protection Associations, the standard is 13, NFPA 13, and within that standard, it gives you a, a duration and you know size of the sprinkler heads, and you can do the calculation on how much water you specifically need for the sprinkler system alone. Okay. But now that, that's just the sprinkler system. There are fire flow requirements based on building construction that comes straight out of the building code and they are typically more onerous than specific sprinkler requirements. Right. So you can, if you meet the building code requirements, typically you've already covered the sprinkler requirements. Okay. And, and in what cases um, is a sprinkler system not required? I noticed you said in most cases it would be required for an indoor structure. Um, so we've been looking, you know, as we get new people inviting us into new places, then we have to, you know, I was invited into a, a place that already has cut flowers and the guy's working side by side with a guy with cut flowers and so he'll be doing some processing trimming in this area. I mean, it's basically the same use and so it, the building's 50 years old, so it came in long before sprinkler requirements, so, Maybe we wouldn't require fire sprinklers if he confines himself to just trimming and along with the cut flowers in a building that's already intended for that use. Now the downside is he's got no water supply and essentially the access road doesn't meet the current requirements. So there could be trade-offs. Maybe he sprinkles the building and he doesn't have to worry about the road and he has to bring some sort of water supply to us. I mean, that's pretty much a given. We have to have hydrants. Okay. All right. Thank you. If uh, a, a fire hydrant were to be installed, is there are there services for that, or who does that, and how much does it cost? Yeah. So those are general contractors or guys that do underground work. Um, you know, I can't spe specify, but you're looking at like Granite and Durden and a bunch of big contractors that do underground work for hydrants. I had a question about the 20 foot uh, road width. And uh, so the, ma the main road that accesses our property is a county road. Then we have a driveway, which is around 100 feet long that accesses you know, our portion of the power. So does that driveway need to be 20 feet wide or? So again, back to what it's based on the building. So are you using a building for your growing or it, it processing? Would be, it would be a greenhouse. Oh, okay, so yes, if you're using a commercial greenhouse. Then it would have to be 20 feet wide. Right. So with, mm -hmm. in related to her question, if the county road is 20 feet wide and the fire hydrant is on the county road 
and it's within. So it's got like municipal services in the county, in the, in the road itself? Right, and that is, her driveway may be too narrow, but it's still within 400 feet of that sprinkler on the county road. The hydrant, yeah. Yeah, does that work or? It doesn't change the road requirements. They're, they're all separate requirements. Okay. So, so you could use the hydrant. Yeah, the hydrant is within the distance, so that would be fine. But it doesn't change the road requirements. The road requirements are uh, essentially based on the building. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. So, so basically you can see that early consultation with fire may very much influence your site plans, your development plan altogether. And it's not to scare you, but it's just reality that you do need to kind of know what they're gonna be tracking and, and it may change, it may shift, but you know, for this time, for this moment, um, as you plan your project early, you, got, you wanna have uh, the fire agency come out. Uh, that'll really influence your road and where you want to where you want to set your building and um, many other factors that you'll want to address in your application. So um, I don't think Chris actually addresses. I think there's a small fee for him to come out to the property, him or whoever to come out to the property. Chris, what is the fee for your site visit? There currently oh, there isn't a fee. Okay, no. currently, yeah. currently no fee. We'll see. <laughs> getting quick and getting quick. There's no fee. Yeah. Yeah. But right now you're not. Okay. Currently not a fee that could change as things get crazy. So um, so that's kind of our a real, we're emphasizing that to you now, no matter where you're located, have them come by. Um, and as Chris said, and we will put these requirements on our website, we'll make sure we post it on the resource application page. Um, we'll, we'll provide the list that he read off to you. You can watch this back, but you can also get the list on the website so that you know what to prepare before Chris comes out. Um, and then, you know, assess your alternatives after Chris comes out, um, Chris or whomever. Uh, you might want to scale back or adjust somewhat, depending on what you hear from the fire, the fire marshal. So I'm, I'm almost done, we're almost wrapping up and then we'll take some general questions after that and then let everyone enjoy their summer evening. I just wanna clarify a point of confusion. Uh, one last point is environmental review. Robin talked about it a little earlier, but it's required of all projects. Some folks will be exempt. Um, that can't, you can have an idea if you work with a consultant, if you'll be probably exempt or not, um, but it'll be determined by the permit planner, not you. Um, and that also includes the environmental review. If there is environmental review that goes beyond an exemption, that is not done by your co per, uh, consultant. We've heard people say, oh yeah, we have consultants that are gonna do our CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act Assessment, and that is not how it works. Um, there could be a third party that does prepare a document if needed, but that is initiated by the county and determined by the county, just so you know. Um, and there could be mitigations that are added to your project based on the findings of that environmental review. Um, so one of the final other points to say is, you know, as we've kind of, I think, emphasized here, you're gonna need a, a team and um, it, it may include, you know, there's a lot you can do on your own. Do we have a lot of self-help tools between the planning department website? If you go in there and poke around, there's a ton of helpful information. You can also approach the planning department about some things, like if you wanna get your permit history, you're welcome, like anyone can ask them about that. You can check on the file, the parcel legality, basic, you know, what are the easements to get to the property? Do you, do you even know about your road access? Um, can someone shut that door? It's really loud. Um, you, you need to know about the road access to your site. You wanna be very clear, um, your consultants would know this, but you wanna check to make sure that that easement that gets you to the property, if it's shared, that you are gonna have collaboration with your neighbors to do a commercial cannabis use out there. It's not a given. Um, and you're gonna need some kind of uh, road, shared road agreement with them. Same with the wells. If you have a shared well, there would be a requirement that folks sign on to that well agreement. It, uh, th people have to be in agreement that you, the well use is for cannabis. And we can talk more about that uh, on the side if you have questions, but track those things. And remember um, to, consider these potentially competing, conflicting requirements. We want you to protect the environment. You also might need to comply with ADA or fire code that kind of mess with that issue. And that might tweak how you, where you put your project and how you design everything. So it's a bit iterative, but if you look at it up front and are aware of it, you're gonna have less slip ups later. Uh, this is just to help you 
plan better. Um, also, don't lose your paperwork. When you give us documents in our department, this is a funny little detail, but people just give us what they have and they have no copies. Make copies of your documents, very, very important. Um, you never know what happens in our, we're good, but you know, things can get lost. <laughs> and um, keep your documents, keep a copy of what you gave us. Um, and uh, you know, there'll be other departmental fees. We don't want to make it sound like it's all about, but it is, you know, not so cheap at first to start up. So there will be fees charged by the different departments for their review, and we want you to know that's the case. And we can talk about that if you're curious about those kind of things. Um, and so uh, one other thing, track the state requirements. They are indeed d separate and distinct from us. And so if you're not looking at that at all and you're focusing on all that we ask for and you don't know what the state needs, um, you know, maybe they require different logistics for your grow operation or your site plan and you think it's one and the same, it's not. Our requirements, we try to dovetail everything with each other, but it's not like, um, it's not always overlapping. So as Fish and Wildlife and Regional Water Board said, um, a lot of what you have to provide us, you'll have to provide them, that'll be nice for you, but not all the little site plan details may be the same. So um, do check, don't assume they're all the same. So as a final point, you know, once you've identified your site, do read our rules, please, don't email us and say, I have this property, will it work? Uh, we're really busy and uh, we would love, I would love to help you, but that's just not possible to look up everyone's zoning and, and, and do that. Um, if you really don't understand something, call us, of course, we'll help you understand the rules, but uh, do your homework. Um, and then look at the pre-application questions. It'll help you start thinking about, a lot of what we ask will feed into your business plan and so forth and back and forth. So um, do look at the pre-application requirements. It's on our website under application resources, and then um, look at that you know, build-out plan you want to have. Really think about what do you want, and then invite the fire marshal out, um, and get, get a hold of the permits on the property and the history. If you don't know about that, you're going to want to know about that so you don't show up at planning and, and get surprised. Um, and then call for an appointment. Once you have all your ducks in a row and you feel like you've done your homework and you've filled out that application as best as you can, call Robin and she'll suss out if you're ready and set you up for a pre-application appointment. Um, and do build your team. Like, I, like we said, you really do need help here. Um, most of you will. Um, and with that, I think uh, I didn't... Um, Oh, the last slide. There's just some resources. We'll put this on the website, but um, of course, it's our website information. We also have an FAQ document, frequently asked questions, and a link to the tax and state information just so you can track some of that. And always check our news page for updates. We're not proactively emailing people a lot now. We just want you to go to our website for information. Go to Facebook. You don't have to be on it to look at it. Um, it's a public page. Um, but just track what's going on with us and updates and um, and with that, we're done with the workshop, but we now want to take questions if people have any burning questions to ask. Burning questions. I have a, a, a general No, question. no, we need the mic. Okay. Yeah, all right. Do you want to just like... Um, I mean, I have a very loud voice. I can do no, it. No, no, right, go for okay. it. No, no, it's telephone. I know. It's, oh, you want it on there because it's yes. the... Yeah. Okay. I mean, I could just okay. do it. Okay, my question has to do with um, the expense of everything. I know that people have probably a lot of good faith um, uh, in their uh, desire to meet all the, com the requirements. And if um, uh, people here have their temporary authorization from the county mm -hmm. and their temporary um, authorizations or permits from the state to do whatever they want to do, um, is there a way to feel as a you know a, someone who's trying to act in good faith to go slowly slower than one feels like the, the need it seems like we want to get it all right we want to be in compliance but if we're we've done as much as we can and we're trying to then um you know a budget for what's going to happen in the next six to nine months is that looked upon as being uh, you know not compliant or not you know acting in good faith i think we you know we want to do the as much as we can but if we don't have the money for everything i'm afraid to start something and go down a certain road with a certain agency and then find i can't complete it at that moment right the, the, the just specifically the pre-app or just the whole thing i mean the pre-app right so so everybody has 
time to get their stuff together. I don't want anybody to to give us something that is is not ready for prime time because that that doesn't help you. It doesn't help us, and it will cost. Um, you can go through if if you already did a pre-license inspection and and or you got your local letter. Um, you don't have to pay for the pre-application uh, consultation, so you can get some some information about the direction that you're headed. Um, what I don't want is is for folks to wait and wait and wait, you know, until sort of the last minute and, and then come in and, and be like, oh my gosh, my, my temporary, you know, has run out and now I have to do an annual and, and because we are in this process of transitioning to real applications, right? So the local letters were to keep folks afloat, keep you in business until we had an ordinance. Now we have an ordinance, so now we have applications, we have a permit process. So um, in general, we're, uh, what's in our head, and we haven't you know, necessarily landed on anything uh, firm, but for registrants, sp specifically talking about cultivation, um, registrants will have a year to submit an application, right? So hopefully that gives enough time. If for whatever reason that's not enough time, Talk to us, we'll see if there's you know, some other sort of circumstances going on, we can talk to you. But, but we do want folks to be focusing on the application process. So the pre-app piece is where we sort of help you scope and, and, and make sure you're going in the right direction. But we don't want folks to disappear either and, and, and you know, hang on to their temporary state license and then, and then run out of time. So, so just keep talking to us. And I think it, there's a sweet spot, like we talked about with the phasing, where if you have kind of bigger vision, but just really in the next five years, you're not going beyond some s smaller activity you're doing. I mean, you could stick with that for a while, and then you could you would have to go back to planning for some amendment. I think it would be an amendment to your use permit, right. um, and you'd have to amend your, it, it just, you know, there's costs involved. You have to kind of do that. You have to weigh the options and see what makes sense, but you don't have to go all crazy all at once. Um, so there is some phasing you can do to mitigate the costs you're worried about. Uh, first, I want to thank Loretta for her patience and uh, busting her ass the last couple of years and getting us to where we are today. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but yep, she's, leaving, she's leaving, unfortunately. Yep. So. Hats off to you. Um, the other thing is, so after like speaking with Chris, I, I want to keep the ball rolling, but I also think that it's prudent to have a lot of guidance from fire in particular. And I, um, so would you advise having some guidance from them prior to setting up the the pre-licensing? I would. Yeah, I that's would. what I'm thinking I think too. everybody that, that has not talked to fire about their specific site, had them come out. If you've got plans, show in plan plans. That has the potential to completely change everything, right? It's going to change. If you don't know that you need to do some grading on your road to accommodate 20 feet, that's going to change environmental review. It's going to change the entire scope of your project. So the big, and that's part of what the pre-app is for, but you know, if you've come in to, to the pre-app and, and I ask, you know, so have you checked in with fire and you've said no, I'm like, well, this is great, but this could all change. So absolutely, there's no reason not to, to check in with them. Get, you know, rip the Band-Aid off. If it's going to be bad, you need to know that now. You don't want to wait. And, and be surprised later. And, and that those big kinds of things, you know, are, are you sitting on a fault zone? Are you gonna need a geology report or something? You don't wanna wait and find out after you've spent thousands on, on plans and, and consultants and stuff. Ask the big hard questions now and figure out, is this gonna work or do I have to move or do I have to rescale or reshape my project? Right, yeah, some people are down, you know, a 10-foot road, it's a half mile to the county maintained road, but they want electrified hoop houses, the whole deal Chris was talking about. They have big visions and manufacturing, and that's all beautiful, but if you can't widen that road to standard, whatever the standard may be, well, you better know that early, not get your plans designed and then come to us, spend 50, we don't want you to spend 1,500 if you, you know, might have to tweak things. We don't want to take your money unnecessarily, believe us, we don't. That's um, true. Who's next? For a class two distribution license, my understanding is that one of the requirements is that the applicant provide uh, suitable storage facilities. That's the language in the ordinance. Yes. So uh, the criterion of suitable is determined solely at the discretion of the licensing officer, correct? 
Go for it. I, I mean. Okay, well, yeah. I do have a follow-up okay. to that. All right. So that person, she can help. Um, I think, actually, this is good you brought this up. Okay. So it's not just that point. Yeah, the discretion is true. You propose what you think makes sense for your operation, bearing in mind other constraints we talked about today about environmental issues, neighborhood compatibility, um, and, and so there's the answer there. But that goes for other parts, like the best management and operational practices plan. You want to really, um, there's some criteria and in, in there's some guidance there, but at the same time, you can also tell us what you think you can do to meet that. You know, it's up to you to kind of design the response you think is a winning answer that you can do feasibly and that, you know, that you'll perform and do um, and that will meet our requirements. So there is some creativity allowed here. Right, we're looking at, everything is about impacts, right? So, so to the extent, I don't necessarily care, I'm not a, a building code person, I don't know what the building codes are for, for everything, but we care about where it is and how it functions. So a structure that you're having deliveries coming in and out of, we want to make sure it's not, you know, in the boonies and or that it's not like right adjacent to the road where you have folks coming onto a public road. If you have employees in there, you're going to have to provide an accessible path of travel. So that's going to help determine. So the siting takes into consideration all of these different things you have to be envisioning what does it look like to somebody that doesn't know your project? Somebody driving by or a neighbor, what are they seeing in terms of activity, traffic, parking, noise, all of that stuff is, is part, and then the actual physical imprint, footprint on the ground, all of those things are factors, so it's not any one thing. It is, is, is this a better site than that site over there? I don't necessarily care about what the building looks like unless it's like, you know, nine stories tall or something hideous like that. Don't do that. But if it's just like a regular, you know, I don't know, barn, shed, I don't, I don't particularly care about the, the, the structure itself. I care more about what it, where it is and what the impact is. This, I was just going to say, the state, as everybody here should know, has requirements for everything in terms of storage and protecting everything and testing and all of that stuff. So their, their stuff is gonna be more, more rigorous and less about land use and, and imprint. Go ahead. Okay, so let's say the business model is someone wants to get a class two distribution license and the only activity that they would perform would be transportation of flowers from a cultivator to a licensed distributor or between two distributors. In that case, they would have no storage need. So would it be reasonable to conclude that suitable storage facilities would be no storage facilities? It could be your vehicle, I suppose. I mean, right? So, I mean, you're, tell me where point A is and where point B, C, D. In that, in that circumstance, it's less about the, the impact on the ground and it's more about vehicle miles traveled, right? So what's the, what's the impact to, to traffic and noise and all of that and context? Is this something, is it in a residential neighborhood where they will freak out if you have, which you can't do class two okay. anyway. But Thank anyway, you. yeah, you got it. Um, I had a question about whether or not you know if there are going to be any changes to state requirements in 2019. Is what's what is required in 2018 if we are trying to be compliant with with what is currently, and then if we get one year to apply, but then you don't actually you know get all your paperwork in until sometime in 2019. Are the then requirements for the state going to be different than they are? If I had to bet. I would say that there's gonna be some different stuff. They're changing right now, as most of you know, you know, pretty much everything has some potential to change, so I can't predict. And those are the kinds of things, again, I, I just wanna make sure folks aren't just hiding from us and saying, ah, oh, this is all too crazy, I'm just gonna keep doing my thing. I mean, I want folks to come in, but if you can't, if you're waiting for something or, or you think a regulation is gonna change, you know, I mean, I don't have a crystal ball. I would say apply for what you want and and you'll deal with, we will deal together with whatever those requirements are and, and we'll shape it accordingly. If it if it changes after the fact, I mean, that that happens all the time. It won't impact your, your use permit, but it could change, you know, your licensing. Um, 
but I don't, it, yeah, it's changing. They're, they're making it up too. I had one more question about, because this, the process, this licensing process, I mean, it's gonna take a while. And you know, from my experience, permitting is minimum nine months, and if you're lucky, you can get it done in less than a year. And, um, but what, what do you do in the interim? I mean, in terms of legal, um, uh, what is a policy or whatever it is in the, before you get the license? You're in the process, but you haven't actually gotten right. it. Right, and that's, and that's the, the rub on that is CEQA. So if you have been doing stuff, you can keep doing that to within certain parameters. I mean, unless you're doing something terrible to the environment or whatever. To the degree that you've already been operating some aspect of, of cannabis industry, you can keep doing that and we can talk about what that looks like in terms of a um, authorization letter. But if you're wanting to do something that has not been done, you can't start because that violates the Environmental Quality Act. The, the purpose of CEQA is to evaluate impacts, and once you start something, you've started the impact before we've evaluated it, and that's not allowed, and, and we all get in trouble if we start going down that road. Yeah, some people say, oh yeah, you know, this was tomatoes, I'm just changing it to cannabis, why do I have, what's the problem, and well, hey, you know, you've got, there's changes in uh, employees and uh, water demand and other things that, you know, we're gonna be tracking, so it, it might seem like, hey, it's just CEQA, what's the problem but it's never just that simple I think that's in a nutshell the answer there but we have another question uh, actually a two-part question one for I think Sean is his name from the water ah. Ah, right. uh, and the other one is uh, you mentioned about a feasibility report from a biologist mm -hmm. uh, is required will you give us a list of certain biologists you accept or can we just pick one we have a list that the planning department maintains lists of all um, for biologists, for engineers, geologists. They have a list. If you have somebody, um, it, it depends on what the issue is. So if it's a specific, you know, red-legged frog or something, it has to be somebody who is who specializes in that and is recognized by the state. But we do have a list. Um, there are lots and lots of folks on it. Um, I'm not sure if it's on the planning department website, but we'll put we'll put those kinds of contact uh, pieces what, what, on our website as well. Yeah, yes. what is it you want to see from the biologist? Well, hold on. So it's you, on the resource. Uh, so don't, um, I mean, you are welcome to always hire a biologist and come out early just for your own reasons that you might want them to see the site early. But you'll want to kind of wait till you get into phase two where you submit to planning. And they'll make, I mean, unless we tell you during phase one, hey, you're definitely going to need a bio report. Um, and then we call you, we tell you to go do that. Um, it might be in phase phase two that it, it is called for. So we just wouldn't want you to have them scope uh, an assessment, waste your money when it could have been done at one time um, upon, you know, wouldn't you agree, Robin? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the reason. If you know that you're in Sand Hills, then Definitely there's start. no reason that you can't call right. the, the biologists that we know and work with who specialize in sand hills to rule it out or to start to create okay. you know some sort of plan but um but what you don't want is to go down that path and then have the environmental planners down in in the planning department say oh wait but you forgot to look over here and and again so yeah, you know, it's good to be thinking and you can make calls and you can make inquiries about your property and using Sandhills as, as an example, the, the local biologists know, um, you know, all the Sandhill, you know, areas of the, of the county and so maybe you get some good impa uh, input. Okay. Um, but I wouldn't start spending money until until Thanks it's been too. vetted by planning. Okay. Okay. And uh, yeah, and then sure, uh, if I'm on a well, you talked about groundwater percolation, how would that affect uh, a well. I don't quite know the definition of groundwater percolation. Basically, if you're in a confined aquifer, so if your well is in like a hard rock layer, okay. you're in groundwater. So that's it's just percolating groundwater. That's just like the term. Oh, okay. So if you're in a shallow well, that's could be technically subterranean flow. So then that would be more like surface water. So if you're in a hard rock layer, chances are you're in an aquifer, you're in groundwater. I had a question for you as well. You said shallow well. What is your definition of a shallow well? 10 feet, 12 feet. Like, if you drilled into the ground through a hard rock layer, you're good. If you call me up and say, hey, I'm diverting from a well and I dug it by hand, you're not in a well. Okay. So it, 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 there's no... There's like lots of shades of gray, right? Like what's deep, what's far, what's 
But if you had like a cistern well that's, uh, you know, 30 feet down, corrugated, blah, 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 that. It kind of, it doesn't really depend on the depth. It depends on like the substrate, what it went from. through. So okay. if you have a well log report or completion report, something that states like, I went through hard rock layer, you're, you're good. If okay. you don't have one and you have an idea, it's, it gets a little murky, but like I can't tell you what's deep, what's not deep. It's just, what is it in? Okay, and then um, I have the real concern of, it looks like so many people are gonna be at level five hearings, public hearings. Yeah, and so if there's a hundred of us that have to have level five hearings, what kind of a bottleneck is that gonna create with the County of Santa Cruz? How are you gonna be able to process this? Well, we'll see if we get there. I mean, I, I don't anticipate a hundred folks all at once having everything complete and ready to go to hearing, to be honest. And this is just based on some of the stuff that I'm seeing now. It's not, it's not a knock on anybody, but this is new for folks. These questions are new. I don't expect that everybody in this room understands all of the you know, complexities of zoning code and our licensing and all of that stuff. So, so I think that it will sort of be self-metering in a way, but if it turns out that we get you know, everybody comes in and the plans are clean and good and you move on to, to submitting um, and it starts looking like we need bodies, then we'll hire bodies, right? I mean, at some point we, we start, there will be a rhythm that develops. Part of the, the problem is, well, it's not a problem yet, but I just, I anticipate planning is still like, oh, cannabis, I've heard of that. You know, like they're not quite, you know, down with what this looks like. It's a little bit different than what they're used to with shopping centers or coastal permits or something, but they're getting there. Sorry, so we're running out of time, but I just wanted to say on that um, on that piece there that I think our department and the plant, the county in general, we're gonna be adapting, um, Robin alluded to that. We're gonna be working with you guys to get your license. We want you to be successful. This is the goal of the county. We want everyone to be able to get licensed if possible. So we will adapt as, uh, as needed to make this work. So when we see these things happening, we'll adjust. And I have one last speaker. Hi there, uh, Trevor Luxon, born and raised in Santa Cruz and also a local attorney. Um, I just would like to highlight a couple things. I know there's been a lot of intimidation and hesitation over the new uh, pre-application process. You know, it's a 39 page packet, it's pretty hefty, it's a little bit scary looking, but really it's a preview to the future and if that seems too much to you, then maybe cannabis is too much to you. Um, and you know, that's what it's gonna be from now on. So, you know, expect that, be prepared for that. Um, second thing, I just would, would quickly like to highlight um, our county staff. We're lucky to have a, a really great county staff starting here with, with Robin. And I'd especially would like to highlight <laughs> Mrs. Uh, Loretta Moreno, who unfortunately will be leaving us soon. Um, yes, sir. Like many a shooting star, she moves quickly. And, um, and unfortunately, the, uh, the state of California has snatched her off to, to Sacramento. So we're gonna miss her a lot. She's one of, I believe, the original, um, the original members of uh, um, the first hire. So, you know, it's too bad, but we'll, we'll miss her a lot, so, okay. Thanks, Trev. Thanks very much. All right, and we will have more of these, I promise. And we'll, yeah. Okay. Um, there's still folks outside. I don't know if they're sticking around or not. But we'll be around. We'll be around with you. Uh,